Hey guys, it's Jim Kang. Today, um, I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, chapter two of our Brain Facts book, which is on the developing brain. So, ex so this pr chapter deals with how our brain matures. So to start off, uh, we're gonna have to talk about um, induction, neural induction. So, neural induction is a process by which we get different types of nervous system cells. For example, interneurons, motor neurons, glial cells. So the way this happens is. Um, well, as you guys know, there are three embryonic layers. There, you have an endoderm, an ectoderm, and a mesoderm. So the way um, you get different types of nervous system cells is that the mesoderm releases a signaling molecule called sonic hedgehog. And, it, and this signaling molecule triggers uh, tissue in the ectoderm to develop into specific types of nervous system cells. This is based on the proximity of the ectodermal tissue to uh, the signaling molecule. So for example, you have an ectodermal tissue, piece of ectodermal tissue that's really close to sonic hedgehog, it would turn into uh, glial cells. However, if the ectodermal tissue were further away, it would turn into a uh, motor neuron or an interneuron. Um, so yeah, so the take home message is that the signaling molecule turns um, the ectodermal tissue into different types of cells based on uh, location. So once you get um, these different types of cells, the next step would be to get the neurons to the right places in the brain. And this process is called migration. So this process is actually um, this process is actually fairly early on inside the whole like uh, pregnancy um, business. Um, it's three to four weeks after a human baby is conceived. So to make a long story short, um, you have a neural tube. Things move from the inside to the outside. Um, to explain it more detailed, um, the ectoderm will start to thicken and build up along the middle. It'll then form a neural plate and it'll get ridges. The ridges will then fold in to make a neural tube. Once you have that, um, the tube will thicken into three bulges that form the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. So then, so once you get that part, um, then you're gonna have the neurons moving from the inside to the outside. Um, you're gonna have them moving from the inner zone, the ventricular zone to the outside, the marginal zone. So how do these neurons um, know where to go? How, how, what are they guided by? Um, they're guided by um, glia. Um, about 90% of the time, um, glia will actually provide scaffolding for uh, the neurons to go from uh, point A to point B. Um, this is a delicate process. Um, so things like alcohol, cocaine, radiation, they will affect um, migration. So this is part of the reason why um, you know, when you have a baby, um, it's not good to you know, do drugs or drink a lot of alcohol. Um, let's see. If there's anything else you have to know about migration, it's that um, uh, migration occurs in an inside-out manner. So cells that arrive the earliest will form the deepest layer of the cortex. Cells that arrive later are going to form an outer layer. Um, this makes sense, actually. Um, it's like when you put in dirt in a hole, um, the dirt that you put in first is going to be at the bottom, and the dirt that you put in later is going to be at the top. It's, it's the same principle. So once, um, so okay, so we already covered um, induction and migration. So now we have to talk about how the neurons form connections. So as the neurons are finding their particular locations, they're going to have to form the right connections between uh, different cells. I mean, that's how they communicate, right? So the way it does this, um, so neurons are going to have uh, specific parts on, the, on their axon tip called growth cones. And growth cones actually explore the environment as they seek out the right places. Um, and actually, um, the growth cones have a lot of important molecules on them. Um, they have signaling molecules called netrin, semaphorin, ephrin. Um, so these um, growth cones with their um, special molecules are going to uh, find the right places and they're going to form um, connections between different types of, uh, between other uh, neurons. So it's remarkable because um, the process, this process is actually very similar among many different types of animals, you know, bugs, mammals, worms. Um, so actually, um, when you look at the process of development, there are a lot of similarities across organisms. So once you get the connections, um, uh, you know, the cells will start signaling with each other, right? They're going to have synapses, you know, they're gonna, you're going to have the action potentials going. Um, we've already covered this in chapter one, so if you need details on um, the way the signaling happens, I would suggest you refer back to chapter one. I also suggest going back to um, a textbook, a biotextbook or something, because the biotextbooks actually explain the process of um, action potentials very well. Okay, so... Uh, Let's see here. Oh yeah, right. In myel myelination, right. We have to talk about myelination. So this is actually very important. So the reason why our brain signals are so fast um, is because of the fact that our brain has a myelin sheath. Um, so the myelin sheath, as you guys know, are made of glia. Uh, 
So, and the way the myelin uh, speeds up signaling um, by a factor of up to 100 times is um, the myelin has gaps called nodes of Ranvier. And the signal will jump between um, these gaps. Um, and this is how um, the signaling is really fast. Um, the way the um, signal jumps from one node to another is called saltatory conduction. And this is a term that you guys have to know. Um, so how does this relate back to um, brain maturation? Well, the process of myelination occurs throughout the lifespan. So that's why um, diseases such as multiple sclerosis, which we'll get into later, um, are really important. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about um, is the concept of uh, pairing back uh, plasticity and critical periods. So when we're born, um, we actually were born with um, more neurons than we really need. Um, so as the brain begins to form meaningful connections, as it starts to gain information, and it's going to weed out the neurons that it doesn't really need. Um, this process is called pairing back. Um, so this isn't some kind of insignificant process. Actually, the brain pairs back half of the neurons that it initially had. So it's not like it's getting rid of a couple. It's getting rid of a lot of them. So uh, as it pairs back, um, so pairing back um, is done by a specific process that we learned in AP Bio called apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. Um, so this process um, is how um, the brain will get rid of the neurons that it doesn't need. So then, um, this is also so this is also explains the concept of a critical period pretty well. Uh, critical periods are periods in our life where we're ac we're actually um, more receptive to learning. You know, people have said that they learn music and language better when they're little kids, and the cr concept of a critical period explains this very well. Um, so, critical period in during our critical periods, um, um, you it do, it is found that um, we have more neurons um, during a critical period. So. When people say they learn better when they're um, little, it's because um, that's the part, that's the time in our lifespan when we're um, forming connections before we pair back the ones that aren't necessary, when we pair back the neurons that aren't necessary. Um, so now that we're talking about critical periods, we can talk about um, our ma the maturation of our brain. So the brain will actually keep maturing into the early 20s. So, um, so the, the roaring 20s. <laughs> It's a good way to remember. Um, so, yeah, so even when you're um, an adult of at like, you know, 18 years old, your brain's not actually completely mature. You have to wait till maybe like 22 or 23 in order to get a mature brain. Um, and as the brain matures, um, the concept of pairing back will uh, come back because, because um, there's the cellular saying of use it or lose it um, actually in, uh, means a lot. You have to use your brain parts in order to form meaningful connections with them. Otherwise, the brain will just deem it unnecessary and just get rid of it. Um, so that's why um, when you want to teach your kid like you know, music or teach them another language, teach it to them when they're little. Um, let's see. The last thing I want to talk about is plasticity. So the plasticity is the ability of our brain to mold itself to um, uh, our environment. So it's kind of like you know molding plastics. Um, so plasticity um, is the ability of the brain to uh, modify itself, and it's actually done um, in two ways. You can have experience expectant or experience dependent plasticity. Experience dependent plasticity is when um, the brain molds itself um, uh, because um, it's been thrust into a specific situation. For example, let's say you're in like a calm classroom setting, and all of a sudden you got tossed into like I don't know, like a war zone. Then your brain would have to modify itself um, to match the situation. That's experience dependent plasticity. The opposite, um, the other end of plasticity would be experience expectant plasticity. So experience expectant plasticity is when your brain molds itself because it's a normal part of uh, development. So the book gave the example of the finches, right? The finches have to hear adult songs in order to, you know, become properly mature. This is experience expectant plasticity. The brain molds itself in order to grow up, essentially. So, yeah, with plasticity, um, that concludes our uh, talk of uh, chapter two. So if you, if you guys have any specific questions um, about chapter two, please feel free to leave comments or talk to me at school. Um, in, in the next video, I'll be talking about chapter three, which deals with um, the brain's senses and the way the brain perceives the environment. Thanks for watching, guys.